All right. Uh, to be fair to Jen Zaxel, I didn't write all of the math library. He wrote the linear algebra and uh, number theory stuff, which is also very good. All right, so Racket has pretty darn good floating point support. A, a lot of it is thanks to efforts um, from Matthew and, and Sam and Vincent um, to get it jitted and to, uh, and to do some uh, static analysis on it to uh, optimize it. It's also um, very compliant. It makes it a really nice base to build stuff on. So I built stuff. Um, I built stuff that I needed and then made sure it was good enough to share and you can find it in uh, special functions and distributions and also in some, well, <laughs> in some other places like, uh, well, I didn't do racket x flow num, that was uh, somebody else's, but you can get 80-bit floating point support there and big floats in the math library, you can get as much precision as you like. Uh, calculate pi to, you know, 6,000, 60,000, 6 million decimal places. Kind of fun. Um, now, there's also this other weird little module in math called math slash flonum, which exports a bunch of things with weird names like fl and flnext plus max dot zero flonum to ordinal and stuff that makes you sound like you're chanting like an evil priest, flog 1p squared 1pm full cause petroleum, ah, you know. <laughs> so um, today my objective is to explain what some of those things are and how you might use them without inducting you into the high priesthood of the holy order of floating point experts. So this is kind of a tutorial talk. So a lot of us view floating point as sort of a black box and you know floating point numbers as black boxes and floating point operations as black boxes that operate on other black boxes. It's not quite like that and I think everybody in here could have actually invented floating point if you had to. It's nothing more than scientific notation packed into a bunch of bits. That's it. So if you're going to do this in typed racket for example you'd need a field for the sign so plus or minus and another field for the significant, which is the N up there in the scientific notation, and another field for the exponent. Now, of course, being computer scientists, we believe that two is a nice round number, so these are all two to the X in there. To convert one of these things to a uh, exact rational, you could write a function like this that just pulls the fields out, multiplies the sign to and the significant, and the exponent, or two raised to the exponent field. Number negative 10 is just a negative one sign times 10 times two to the zero, which is of course one. And then <coughs> the number negative 80 is negative one times 10 times two cubed, which is of course eight. Floating point multiplication is very simple, provided that you remember that when you multiply, you know, two to the m and, oh sorry, two to the m1 and two to the m2, it's the same as two to the m1 plus m2. And you could write your floating point multiplication function just like this. Pull all the fields out, multiply the signs, multiply the significance, add the exponents, and you're finished. Yeehaw! So that's pretty cool. So negative 10 times negative 80 is 800, as we should expect. Now, there's one caveat. This floating point implementation, well, every time you multiply two numbers, the significant doubles. So we can't really have that kind of unbounded growth. Instead, we decide that floating point numbers live inside of a finite space. <coughs> um, for flow nums, they're 64 bits. A significant is effectively 53 bits. The sine, of course, takes one bit, and we get an 11-bit exponent. Uh, because we're limited, we need to round. The significance, sorry, because the significance are limited, we need to round after every operation to the nearest floating point number to the exact one. And because we have a limited exponent field, we have to sort of represent plus and minus infinity, or we have to represent cases where we, we have answers that are too big or too small. That's where positive and negative zero and positive and negative infinity come from. As a consequence, this is actually pretty cool. Because there are finitely many of them, there's a well order. There's always a next floating point number. Um, FL next is how you get the next one from anything. It's uh, exported from mass slash flow num. And so the next biggest number after zero is 4.9 times 10 to the negative 322 in case it ever comes up on, I don't know, Trivial Pursuit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, it also means that there is a mapping from the integers to the floating points and it's, uh, it's bijective. So uh, there, that's exposed through flonum to ordinal and ordinal to flonum. So you can see that the largest floating point number that's not infinite plus max dot zero, its ordinal index is 
9.2 quadrillion. That's a lot of floating point numbers that are positive. Now, this is interesting. We can also subtract these ordinal numbers to find out how many there are between any two floating point numbers. And there are 4.6 quadrillion between 0 and 1. Have you noticed a non-uniformity? OK. <laughs> Half of the floating point numbers between 0 and infinity are between 0 and 1. Okay. <laughs> They get wildly spaced apart as they get larger. That's just because of how they're encoded, using an exponent. Okay, another consequence that we're all familiar with is that most floating point functions aren't exact. Not even uh, addition and subtraction. Only absolute value, really. <laughs> Which is pitiful, but we live with it. All right, so because they're not exact, we need to come up with another way of measuring error. And the best way to do that is to, oh, sorry. Of, uh, of saying what it means for a floating point function to be correct. We say one's correct when it minimizes error. To have some notion of error, we need a notion of distance. The notion of distance we use is in ALPS, units in last place, which is the distance between two floating point numbers, uh, between a floating point number and the very next one. So the unit in last place for this approximation of pi, 355 113 thirteenths, which is pretty cool, is uh, 4.4 times 10 to the minus 16. That's, uh, Pretty small distance between it and the next number. Um, we just convert the distance to ALPS to get error. And uh, the math library conveniently exposes something that measures the error between a floating point number and any real. And it handles NANDs and infinities and stuff. So the error between, OK, so we got to compare these. It looks like our 355 113 thirteenths approximation shares about seven digits with pi. So that's not bad. In ULPS, the difference is, it, yeah, it's 600 million ULPS error. That's quite a lot, so, hmm. All right, so we say that a floating point function is correctly rounded when its output's maximum error is only half an ULP. So there's a good reason for this. If your function's actual output, you know, the you know, precise output, it Try again. It always resides between two floating point numbers. It's got to return a floating point number. The nearest one is only half an ulp away, up to. So that's what a correctly founded, rounded function does. There is fine print here. This assumes that the inputs are exact. That this assumes that the real number, that the thing you're calculating, the inputs to it, are actually real numbers, the exact values that you want to calculate. They're not always, in fact, Floating point numbers usually have some error. But if they happen to be exact, then you get guarantees. Otherwise, you get no guarantees. This is going to come back and bite us. <clears throat> <laughs> It'll be fun. So uh, let's, oh, wait a minute. This is the first time I've run this on Jay's laptop. So we are going to test Jay's laptop and see how good it is at subtraction. See if its subtraction <laughs> is actually correct. Should be good. <laughs> well, it's recent, so it should be. So when you. So we're just going to plot an error surface, the error between what the floating point function says and what Racket's exact rational says. Now, plot gives you exact, uh, exact coordinates to plot in. Um, in order for us to pass exact floating point numbers to the floating point minus function, uh, we're going to convert those to floating point numbers and pretend that's what plot gave us in the first place. Okay? So let's see what kind of error we get on. Ooh, very good, Jay. It looks like your laptop always, yeah, all the error is 0.5 or below for subtraction. Cool. Now, for logarithm, we, don't, we can't actually compute a logarithm in finite time on Jay's computer unless in your, uh, <laughs> you had a TM halts function in your slideshow, so maybe it can do that. <laughs> anyway, this time we're going to import the big float version of log and compute to 128 bits of, uh, uh, with 128 bit significance and pretend that it's exact, okay? So that's what we'll compare our floating point log with. And let's see, 0.5, yeah, all less than 0.5. So Jay's logarithm is good too. Good, Jay's laptop. Hmm? There is? Right here? Oh, that's down at zero. So no, it. The other side, the other end. Go up. No, oh, I think that's a tick mark on the plot. What? 
Oh, yeah, yeah, the plot, the plot vertical extent is computed from the outputs, and so it would have shown us something, it would have shown the number 0.5 if it had ever gone above. All right, so now to be correct, a function only has to be correct on exact inputs. What if you give it exact, if inexact inputs? So this time, instead of changing what plot gives us into a floating point number and pretending that it was the exact real we're interested in, uh, we're going to do it right before we send it to log. So we're composing something that might create some error, com uh, converting an exact rational to a floating point with log and see what happens. So around one, log is, uh, log, yeah, that's not good. So if you have something with error and it's near one, don't send it to log because it'll give you garbage. That's actually that, yeah, okay. <clears throat> No, no, this is not something that Jay's laptop did. This is a property of the mathematical function. We'll get to that. Okay, so as an example, I had to implement this function right here. I wanted to do it as accurately as possible about three weeks ago. Uh, don't worry about what it is. Just look at it as the quotient of two logs, log of u divided by log of 1 minus p. So the first thing we'll do is... Uh, we'll take a first stab at it by pretending that the floating point functions are actually real functions and just, you know, transliterate it there. And then as a, uh, as a reference, we'll do it in big floats. All you need to do to use big floats is require the library and change all your FLs to BFs and your, uh, and your constants to uh, stuff like 1.BF or pass them to the BF function. This is going to use big floats to compute and then return an exact rational. <coughs> and plot our error over our domain in the unit square. Okay, it looks like it has sort of a problem. It looks like it may be ramping up there on the left side where P gets close to zero. So we should zoom in and look and zoom in further. 10 to the six. Oh, okay, six times 10 to the eight. That is as bad as the error is 355 one is as an approximation of pi. We, we're getting seven digits of accuracy in this part of our function. Unfortunately, this is perfectly normal. <clears throat> Most of the time when you implement a floating point function as you know, a direct implementation, pretending the floating point operators are real number operators, you get this. It's mostly right in most places, except there are some places where it just goes terrible. Fortunately, you can usually fix it using just floating point numbers. How? Well, uh, most functions that you're going to use in your implementation have places that you should avoid. They're called ill-conditioned places. I'm just going to call them bad lands. Places where they turn low input error into high input error. Now, the condition number of a function is that, you know, we're not going to listen to this guy. Okay, so... <laughs> well, he was going to tell us how to compute the condition number to see how bad it is. Let's just look at some error plots, right? Okay, so we have uh, the exact difference between x and y. We'll compare that with what we get with um, a little bit of inexactness, subtracting two slightly inexact numbers. And these are the bad, this is the bad lines for subtraction, right along the diagonal. So subtracting two nearby numbers tends to increase error if they happen to be inexact. The bad lines for the logarithm, we've, we've actually seen this before. It's around one. For division is very interesting. Uh, this isn't because the plot is restricted to uh, the wrong domain. The ba the, there are no bad lines for division, it turns out. It, or in other words, the error that you get from division doesn't depend on what the argument values are, just their error. Uh, multiplication is exactly the same way. Okay, so armed with this knowledge of bad lands, let's take a look at our function. We can reason about it recursively. We can't do anything about division, except make sure whatever it gets is accurate. If the input u is exact, and I need to stop here because we're going to make the same assumption as is normal when you're talking about floating point correctness. Yes, u and p, the inputs to our function, are exact. So if u is exact, which it is, then log of u has very little error. If p is, is exact, which it is, then subtracting one, uh, one minus p has very little error. Uh, but if it's exact and near zero, then one minus p is inexact and near one, and we straight into the bad lines of the log function. And that's why we have error. Hmm. So we'll check math slash flow num for another incantation. This is where all those crazy names come from. In this case, a good solution is using log 1p, which just computes log of 1 plus x. 
that's it. Which seems like a really stupid function. But <coughs> unlike log, it passes through the origin. And yeah, for some interesting reasons, um, it's a good substitute. Not only that, we can use it directly. Log of 1 minus p is the same as log of 1 plus negative p. <laughs> so we'll stick it in there and see how it does. Ooh, that looks much better. Our error on the left side, where p is close to 0, went lower. And as we zoom into that side, it continues to be low. And in fact, as you keep zooming in, it continues to be low all the way near 0. So um, we did really well, actually. Uh, three ulps of error is really pretty darn good. Now here's a question. Does the function we just wrote have badlands, places where it uh, magnifies input error? Well, it turns out that it does. Around where p is near 1, you can barely see that, and u is near 1. Um, we can kind of reason about this using our implementation. We did a log of u, and so if u is near 1, then, yeah, of course we'd get some error. And 1 minus p, let's see, when p is near 1, 1 minus p is, yeah, they're close together. So that's in the subtraction badlands. However, there's actually nothing we can do about this. This is a property of the function that we're computing, not a property of our implementation. And you with constructive reals. With constructive reals, yeah. Would they just take a long time to compute in those areas? Is the, is the grand truth, you, you have the grand truth after. Then you could have an actual system tell you, oh, there's something you do about it. But if you could tell something about it, you could have maybe synthesized your particular log, log 1p for that case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And deal with the bad Yeah. If there were something we could do, we could split up our domain and compute it differently there. Yeah. yeah but that there is nothing. You discover the, the ground truth. But you don't have any ground truth. Right. Now, we don't have ground truth, but we have a decent substitute. That's big floats. So uh, when I do math library functions, I tend to use them a lot as you know ground truth with lots and lots of bits. So I'm sure I'm close to it. <laughs> I, I'm doing anything else. I think is uh, too complex for anyway. We can talk about that after. All right. So to debug in the way I'm showing you, here's what you do: make a direct implementation, a reference one, use big floats to approximate reality. <clears throat> okay. Uh, <laughs> then repeat this. To find out where you have high error. Uh, zoom in on those spots. Use that to guide your debugging. Um, see if it tells you anything about where you're wandering into the badlands of some function that you're using in your implementation and replace it. Generally, you should avo avoid subtracting values that are close together, taking logs of things that are near one, and most zero crossings, exponential growth, and generally doing floating point. <laughs> uh, it's a good idea to move multiplication and division outward because they don't depend on uh, having exact inputs. And that usually moves things inward so that they can operate, you know, things that do have bad lines so they can operate on exact things. Now, what if you do need more bits? There are certain cases where you're doing a long running computation that just accumulates error and there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, Racket's X flow nums are pretty darn fast, and they operate at 80 bits precision. I think they're available on every platform we support. Is that right? Are they, Matthew? Uh, they're, they're, oh, yeah, they're probably available on your, you mean my machine or their machines? Okay, their machines, good. All right, uh, about there, uh, something that the math library has exposed for, or is Sorry, provided for a long time, but I just documented three weeks ago. <clears throat> Our double double flow nums you use two floating point numbers that are not overlapping to represent one value. You get about 105 bits of precision out of that. Uh, multiplication, sorry, uh, addition and subtraction tend to be pretty fast, but uh, everything else is about 10 times slower than X flow nums. If you want to go even slower but more bits, big floats tend to be about 10 times slower than those. Uh, but you get as much precision as you could possibly ask for. And if you're really hard up, you can do exact arithmetic using Racket's exact rationals. I want to emphasize, though, an important data point. For our example, if we were to use just you know, more bits as our solution, we'd need 1,074 of them to compute that function accurately over its entire domain. So really, there is no good substitute for, uh, for debugging. That's all I have. Thank you.